Father God, I do thank you, Lord, today. What a privilege to be in your house. And Lord, we know that today there's so much for us to learn. Oh, Lord. Lord, you are the only one that can make this understandable. Lord, I don't care what techniques, what anything I can use. Lord, if it's not revelation by the Holy Spirit, we're, we're toast today. We need you today. We need you. Lord, do the thing. We just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I was informed that last week I sounded like a chipmunk on steroids. <laughs> that I went a little fast. I still went to complete term of time. We had just so much to share. So today, what am I going to do? The same thing, probably. Okay, here we go. Anyway, I'm gonna, the review is going to be a little bit quicker than, than what you think. Okay, so here we go. The path in the tabernacle. We're still walking through the tabernacle. This has been you know, one of those little slow walks. I mean, we've been taking our time walking through here, okay? Path in the tabernacle. Well, today we're going to hit the goal. Today we're hitting the goal. We're going. Okay? How exciting is that? Okay. Remember, we went to the five posts. There the senses, perceptions hang on. We came into the holy place from outside in the outer court. We came in. We found out that the, the, the furniture in the holy place is about our mind, our will, and our emotions. It is our soul. Our soul is in the holy place. Then there's four more pillars, and those are the attributes that God wants us to have, and it's the attributes that he has. He's trying to make us Christ-like. What a goal. You know, we look at him and go, wow, God, you got a lot more faith than I do. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> oh, that was a good line, you know? Okay, anyway, what happens there, we found out that the veil hangs on those pillars and the veil has been ripped when Jesus was on the cross and he replaced the veil with himself and he is the veil no man comes to the father but through him now this is so important that we know that the veil is him and that's where our heart is is in the veil what's inside is the presence the spirit of God lives within our spirit still the biggest mystery of all times to me Still, I can explain it, I can argue it, I can teach it, I can go for it, and I still don't get it. I, I know, I got a picture this morning of what we're going to be talking about today is like we're on thin ice. Anybody ever walked on thin ice? Where's Brett? You ever been on thin ice when you went fishing? No. If you're your size, it better be thick ice. Amen. Okay. Thin ice is that little stuff that when you're walking on it, it starts cracking. Okay. What I saw this morning is I saw, I saw me, I saw us together kind of walking on thin ice. And what is this thin ice? It was a covering over the Grand Canyon. And I know, I know we're ready to break through. I know we're going to go for depth that we've never known before. And I don't even know what that looks like. Yeah, just thought I'd share with you. Messing with me. Anyway, what's back there? What's in the Holy of Holies? Well, that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's where the glory is. That's where the covenant lives is back there. Okay? It's in the back. It's in the Holy of Holies. Wow. Last two weeks we've been talking about false identities. Our false identities. It's like a veil over the face of Moses. It's, it's a false identity. It's something that covers our face so that people can't see who we really are. We're living in these false identities. We've been doing this for so many years. We're so comfortable with them. We wouldn't know what to do with ourselves if we ever saw ourselves. Okay? That's really important. What do we do with these false identities? Well, these false identities are either called in or received. It's either something I did because of my choices to make false identity or something that was given to me that I received a lie. Okay? Somebody did something and I received a lie of who I was. That's an identity, called in or received. It keeps us from seeing who we really are. A false identity keeps us from seeing who we really are, just as much as it keeps others from seeing who we really are. A false identity is a false identity. It just messes up everything, every direction. It traps us into walking in the flesh. A false identity is something that traps us into walking in the flesh. And we'll walk in the flesh, and we will justify walking in the flesh with it. A false identity is a killer. It's absolutely a killer. It is killing us. 
It makes us fight or confirm these false identities. Fight or confirm, either way. And the enemy doesn't mind which one we do. Okay? And I use the illustration that if a, a boy thinks he's inadequate, his father tells him, you're just nothing, I, I wish you'd never been born, you can't do anything right, go be with the women, you're useless, whatever. And he gets this idea. Now, he can do one of two things. He can fight it or confirm it. But either way, his focus is on it. He is inadequate. Now, when he fights it, it means that he'll take on anybody to prove he's, in, he's not inadequate. He's trying his hardest to prove it. So he'll, he'll climb the toughest mountain. He'll, he'll go you know, skiing down anything. And he'll drive the toughest car. And he'll do whatever he can to prove that he's not inadequate. But in his heart, he knows he is. Or he'll confirm it. He'll be totally unable to do anything because he says, well, I can't, I'm useless. Now, I've seen this go both ways. Which one of them is, is, is the false identity? Both. And they both focus on this false identity so much it becomes them. That's who they are. It's who they see themselves. It's a heavy-duty deal. Either fight it or confirm it. It's hard to explain. But if you look at your life, you are trying your hardest to fight problems that you've received somewhere along the line. And you know it, you'll either fight it or confirm it, one or the other. Kind of weird. What's really bad, though, is since it gives us our identity, and our fi false identities give us our provision, they provide for us things, and they give us our protection, they protect us from people getting too close to us and hurting us again. Since it provides identity and provision and protection, it's a covenant. We have found that you enter into a covenant with your false identities, and what that does is it keeps you from going into the covenant that God has for you. Now, we have known this. You know, I did a dumb thing this week. I shouldn't even say this. I probably don't have time for this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Just on the grins and giggles, I opened up my PowerPoints of all the covenant. I had started going through the covenant and just, see, just clicking through the PowerPoints, going through the covenants. And I'm sitting there going, wow, I've just learned a whole bunch about the covenants. Maybe I should teach on this one of these days. But what I got about that is this. Our understanding of covenants is a lot deeper than we ever thought about. We deal with them without understanding them. The children of Israel, what'd they do? They entered into false covenants so they wouldn't have to have the real one. Remember what we talked about when they went to, the, to Mount Sinai. What happened? The people said, no, we will not get close to God. We want Moses. You get close to him and we'll do whatever you say. And what did they do? They entered into the law. They entered into a covenant of law that was not what God had in mind. He had a covenant of relationship. Remember that? Anybody remember any of that? Amazing. We've done the exact same thing. And what do we do is we enter into a covenant of our own law. We determine how things work. And what are we doing when we do that? We're negating the covenant of relationship that God has for us. It just makes sense. It's scary sense. It's like, Oh, no. Okay. I shouldn't have stayed there that long. It's okay. Re our false identity replaces Jesus and who he says he is in our lives. Okay. If we have an identity of poverty, it doesn't matter if God says, I'll take care of your needs according to my riches and glory. It doesn't matter. We call Jesus a liar and we say, no, this is the way I am. Isn't that amazing? It's just amazing. Okay. Now, we did discover this. There you are. There's the the holy place, it's kind of cut off a little bit there. There's the outer court. And there's the holy of holies and the four pillars going into the holy of holies. We know that Jesus is right there. He's the veil, and that's our heart. Okay? We also know that the Ark of the Covenant is back there. Now, one of those fun little things, we're starting to understand that it's not the Ark of the Covenant that's important. It's what's in the Ark of the Covenant. It's just a box. What's inside is what God wrote when he made a covenant with man. So what's inside is what's important, but that's really true too, is right now, what's back there? It's the Ark of the Covenant. How exciting. In our covenant, we get our identity, we get provision, and we get protection. That's all back in our covenant, okay? And I've taught on that so many times, I'm not going to do it again for this day, okay? But that's back there where my covenant with the Father is in Jesus. Now remember, the Father and the Son walked the covenant path. It was the fiery pot and the smoking furnace, or the fiery furnace and the smoking pot. I can't remember which one those are. But anyway, they walked the path of blood. 
Does the Father and the Son walk the path of blood? Abraham stood off the side and went, uh, 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 uh. and they're saying, shut up, we're doing business here. And they got it all done. Then the covenant was with Abraham. He says, now enter into covenant with me. That was, that was with Jesus. We gain the covenant by being in Jesus Christ who has covenant with the Father. That's very important to realize. We're back there. That's the covenant with the Father in Jesus. But then we made all these false identities. And, and the Bible says that it's like veils on our face. It's new veils, false identities. And those false identities keep us from seeing who we are. They keep us locked into the flesh. They keep us out of the holy of holies. They keep us in the holy place. And so what we do is we are worshiping ourselves. We're trying to take the glory from over the holy of holies and drag it to over the holy place and say, you're not good. And we found out that it's all idolatry. Every bit of it is idolatry. Am I making sense or am I rambling real, real bad? I'm okay? If I'm making sense to Greg, it scares me. Anybody else? When we start, hey, okay. <laughs> but we also found out that God is spirit. And if I'm bounced away from going inside where God is, what am I walking in? I'm walking in the flesh. We also know that God is love. If I am keeping out of the holy of holies, what am I walking in? I'm walking in lust. If God is, is light and I'm keeping out of the holy of holies, then what am I walking in? I'm walking in darkness. So what do we have to do? Well, right, now just focus your attention right there. What do we need to do is we need to get rid of these veils so we can see who we are. And that's what we've been doing for the last two weeks is taking those things off. That's when we find out that we are the glory. We are the glory of the Lord that we can see in a mirror. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 is kind of a theme verse of these. It says, for you have put off the old man. As we, see, I look at that. See, blue, not red. Now you can actually see it. See, I, I can be taught. All right. You have put off the old man as regards the former behavior, having been corrupted according to deceitful lusts. You do the work here. It's something that we did in the spirit, and we also have to do it in the soul. Okay? Shows the need for change in our soul. Then it says to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that shows process. It's not one of those things we walk in and exchange it. This isn't Walmart. I got a bad one, I go in and exchange it for a good one. It's not a single process, not a single thing. It's a process, not an event. It's something that is going to take some time to renew the mind. Anybody here know that? You're, you're living that one? Taking a little while to get the mind changed? A little while? How long do you have? You know? <laughs> yeah, well. <sighs> Renewed in the spirit of our mind. Boy, that's going to take some process. It shows that the change is in the soul. And it says, And to put on the new man, which according to God was created in righteousness and true holiness. It is created already. So all of a sudden we're finding out that there's somebody who God has created us to be. And we haven't put it on. That's in our soul. Fine in our spirit. Our spirit is awesome. But it's our soul that has the problem. Our soul has the problem. Uh, so you can see, what, we, what do we have here? We have two things. Putting off and putting on. Putting off, putting on. That's the way it should be. Okay, putting off, how we have to see it for what it is. Remember, if you remember, we had on the, the, the screen there, we had all these things that were our false identities. Uh, fornication, passion, evil, lust, covetousness, it talks about in Colossians chapter 3. Wrath, anger, malice, evil speaking, shameful speech out of your mouth. These things are on our hearts. They're false identities. But we have to see it for what it is. I talk, talked to a couple last night. I just, for the grins, this guy sent me something really cool. It's a knife. And it he even had it engraved. And it says, to my buddy Lee, love Paul. Engraved on a blade of a knife. And it's a throwing knife. Does he know me or what? Come on. Does this, anybody goes, well, nobody's coveting after my knife. Nobody cares. But it means something to me, doesn't it? Okay, it's like, so I called him up to say thank you. Okay, thanks for the knife, man. Called him up and said, hi, how are you? He says, bad. Oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> when a conversation starts that way, you know you're in for a ride. What was it? Anger. He said something. She got angry. She snipped back. He got angry. He snipped back. And boom, boom. Spiraled down the hill. Crash. Anybody relate? What was the... No. Well, we have a liar in the audience. All right, now, here's... <laughs> Here's the way it works, folks. There have two people completely consumed in their own identity. 
It's a false identity. It's an anger identity. They have their covenant with anger. Two people. It's usually called a marriage. And all it takes is one saying something that triggers and the other one speaking back and that triggers. They're both triggered. They both fell in the flesh and they're sitting there arguing and, they, and I call up just at the wrong time or the right time depending on how you want to look at it. And they went, can you talk to us about this? Okay. Well, who's in sin? Well, both of you are. Now that we've got that established, who needs to repent? And they're going, and we wanted you to call for what reason? You know? <laughs> Like it comes down, folks, it, it does, it's the same thing. It's just this couple, you say they're unique. No, they're totally common. What is it? We are, you have to see our anger for what it is. We have to see our selfishness for what it really is, huh? We are selfish people, and it's all idolatry, we found that out. Okay, confess it and find forgiveness. The first thing you do is take it to the Lord and say, Hey, Lord, <laughs> I did. I'm sorry, I'm bad. Would you, uh, you know... I did this wrong. Would you please forgive me? Let the Lord talk. Break the covenant you had with it. Now, this is all two weeks ago. Okay, this is all review. You can get the CDs and you can get the, the DVDs on this eventually. Soon, not far. This one's almost ready, right? Anyway, don't throw anything at me, okay? I'm vulnerable up here. Okay. Take it off. That's the command. You have to take it off. It's a work we do. We have to take it off. And that's called the circumcision of the heart. Taking the stuff off of our heart that's holding defilement and killing us. Take it off. Put it to death. What's this called? Crucify the flesh. We have to put it to death. And, uh, and know that it died. Yay. Dance on its grave. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Cut it off. Put it to death. This is very simple. This is as biblical as the day is long, folks. This is very, very biblical stuff. We've got to see it for what it is. And, you know, I've, I've explained this to so many people. And when we've walked it through, we're gaining such huge freedoms. But, boy, it's hard to remember that you have to do this on your own. It's kind of hard to remember, isn't it? Amen. Then we went to Colossians 3.10 last week. And having put on the new, having been renewed in full revelation knowledge according to the image of the one creating him, God is complete in our ministry. He wants to leave nothing wanting in our lives. He, was, he wants to be complete. He wants to leave nothing wanting. So don't leave a hole without filling it. Okay? Don't leave that thing. Don't dig that hole. I mean, let's, let's fill this thing up with putting on the new. Something must replace what I just took off. I've got to replace it. Now, that's what we did last week when we started putting up all those things that the Bible says, now put on these things. Put it on. Okay? You took off fornication. What do you put on? You put on purity. You took off things. What do you put on? You put on things to replace it. Took off covetousness, selfishness. Put on what? Love. It, that was the biggest thing at the end. It says, and above all else, put on love, which is the bond of maturity. What's the big end result? Is putting on love. Loving for others. Fascinating. We've got to replace it. Now, this word here in full knowledge, being renewed in full knowledge of the Greek word epignosis, means revelation knowledge. It's knowledge that you can't know. It's knowledge, you know knowledge, but this is superimposed over it. This is only knowledge that God can reveal. God has to show you who you really are. It's not something you can discover in your flesh. It's the image of what he created. Now, this has been the good part to me, is finding out what he created finding out what he called me to be at my conception and bring that into my present. To do this stuff, to bring it, find out who I was, who I really was when he created me. Because I'm not living who I was. Isn't that kind of amazing? Are you a has-been? No, I just never was. But I'm getting there. I am knowing who he created me to be. And I foul that thing up with all these flesh things and choices and wounds. And what am I doing? Getting rid of those now to find out who he called me to be, who he created me to be. So we started putting on. This is still last week. We were commanded to take off the old. We have to replace it with something. We need revelation by Jesus, which means we're doing this all with him. This is all revelation with him. He wants us to put on what he created. We receive it and then become it. And the reason it says that is that we receive it, then become it. Because it says if we can see that we're the glory of the Lord in that mirror, then we can be changed into that image from glory to glory. It shows a process, not just an event. It's an event that leads to a process. 
then we can see ourselves differently and we can be the glory of the Lord. Now, was that fast enough? 20 minutes of review, right? 30 minutes left, yeah, in your dreams. Okay, we must put off. We must get rid of the old man. We must put on. And what are we putting on? We know how to find out who we really are. But here's the good part. There's still much more. There's more. Oh, this is the good part. This is the good part. Would you turn that thing around for me, please? Please duck in front of the cameras this time. It's all really good. This one, you're watching it, goes, okay. I don't want people getting motion sickness just watching the DVDs. Okay, here we go. Romans 13, 12 through 14. And it says this. The night is far gone. The day has drawn near. Let us cast off the works of darkness. Now again, we have seen what? It says we've got to cast off. We've got to cast off the works of darkness. Now, folks, all this is is confirmation. Now, are you listening or are you watching? Okay. Here's the deal. It says right here, let us cast off the works of darkness. We have works of darkness that have become our identity. Works of darkness have become our identity. That's important. We've got to. He says, the day is run here. Let us. Now, who's he talking about? This is to the Romans. He's talking to believers, not unbelievers. He's talking to believers. He says, let us cast off the works of darkness. We have them. We called them on. We've agreed with them. We've taken them. Let us cast off the works of darkness. It's something we do. Let us do it. We have to cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the weapons of light. Now, what have we been doing the last two weeks? We've been casting off the works of darkness, and we've been putting on the weapons of light. What's a weapon of light? You don't think that, that uh, joy is a weapon of light? Oh, my God. I love joy. Joy. Which would you rather have, turmoil or joy? Okay, anybody here love? It says, instead of the spirit of heaviness, the spirit of mourning, what do you need to put on? The garment of praise. That's kind of like a well-known scripture. Take off the, the spirit of mourning, the cloak, this mantle of mourning, and put on this, the mantle of praise. It's something we put on. Listen, you say, but my life is miserable. Maybe if you took off all the mourning and started putting on the garment of praise, your life wouldn't be so miserable. Did you know you can praise in the middle of adversity? Maybe you didn't see what Paul and Silas did. I think being in a Roman prison, being whipped, laying there with chains on your feet is called misery. That's not exactly a recreational sport. Hi, let's go chain ourselves in a prison somewhere. It's not fun. They were in the middle of misery and said, that's it. What are we going to do? We're going to praise. What happened? Man, they were delivered. Folks, you want to get out of it? It's simple. Put off the old man. Put on the new man and do this. Put on weapons of light. It's what I wanted to walk in is weapons of the light. Now, this comes with a huge warning. Huge warning. And I want you all to hear this. This is very, very important. Because it says, let us walk becomingly. When we put on the weapons of light, he says, now let's walk like we're having the weapons of light on. Let's walk becomingly. Let's walk according to it. Walk according to it. As in the day, not in darkness, but in the light. In the light. Not in carousings and drunkennesses. Not in cohabitation and lustful acts. Not in fighting and envy. Now, I have found this to be true. You can take off an identity. You can walk away from it and put on the old identity again. Folks, listen, God would not warn us about this if it wasn't true. I can change my identity, but I can choose to go back to my old identity. Now, when does this really come out strong? really comes out strong when we start taking off addictions. Because every addiction is what? I'm that way because that's who I am. You want to hear the one thing that I really hate, really, really hate, and I get a lot of, lot of flack for this, and I don't care. It's all good. I hate when they stand up in an alcoholics meeting and saying, my name is Alfonso, and I'm an alcoholic. 
I was 20 years in addiction, and I am not still a pervert. Do you understand? I'm not going to stand up in any meeting and say, my name is Lee, and I'm a pervert. I've been dry for 23 years. No! I am Lee. I was a pervert. I took off the works of darkness. I put on the weapons of light. I put on who I am, and I am not a pervert anymore. Anybody hear a little edge in my voice about this? No. It cracks me up, man. I just get a little cranky about this because all they're doing is reinforcing that their identity is being an alcoholic. Does it work, Greg? Yes. It does work, huh? Sure. Okay. You call yourself an alcoholic, you're going to still be an alcoholic. That's your identity. It's your identity. But listen, I took off my identity of a perversion. I took it off. It's not who I am anymore. Who am I? I am purity. It's not just something I do. It's who I am. I am purity. I don't need that stuff anymore. I don't want that stuff anymore. I've broken the lust because I don't want it. How do you break a temptation? You don't want it. It's not a temptation anymore. Simple. Okay? Okay? That was called preaching. I wasn't teaching. I was a little preaching mixed in there. Another thing about this, folks, if you go back to it, there's a reason why. And the reason why is because it gives you something to enhance your flesh, and your flesh does not like to die easily. Okay? The subtitle of my... my, my DVD that goes in the book on truly loving is the heart and soul of the Christian life or how to die to self gracefully. Uh, the dying to self is not something that's done gracefully. <laughs> it goes kicking and screaming to the cross. It's not something that is easily done. It's not easy to kill the flesh. It wants things. And there's a reason why. And that's the part you got to get is why does it want it? Why do I want to smoke? Why do I want to drink? Why do I want to look at porn? Why do I want to do these different addictive things? Why do I want the drugs? Why do I want the... There's a reason, and it does something for you. That's the part you have to find, is why. What's it do for you? What's the idolatry here? What does it do for your selfishness? There's something about it it's doing for you. So when you go back, you say, well, I took that off. Yeah, you took off part. Did you take it all? Did you find out the reason why you're there? Did you find out, did the Lord show you what was going on and why you wanted it? You see, this isn't a simple process. This is, this is involved in all the complexities of our soul. Can it be done? Yes. Absolutely. Well, if you take off one thing, are you done? Even if you take that off, are you done? Folks, we've got work to do. Understand. But the God of the universe has given us a warning. He says, let us walk accordingly. You've seen who you are. Now, you have to cognitively walk in the renewing of your mind and see yourself in the new way. Okay. There's something about standing in this amazing set of pure armor, purity armor, standing there with the sword of the Spirit in your hand, having the, the helmet of salvation upon your head, your head being saved in the process of being saved, and you're standing there looking at it, and you say, hi, you want to look at some pornography? <sighs> Why would I want to? I want to walk becomingly to who I am. Okay, there's a tinge of why I want it. I still want it. There's a reason why. I may have taken it all off, but there's still a reason why. Lord, why does that still have a temptation to me? Why? I hate it. I want it gone. Would you show me? You see, we're in this with Jesus Christ. Anybody following me here? We're not in this alone. We're in this because Jesus Christ is wanting to be with us in it. He wants to be there. He wants to show us. He wants to help us. Folks, if there's anything that we teach here, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ, no religion. Get the religion out of the road because religion says if you fall again, you're back to bad. No, you fall. It's just a fall. Go back to the Lord. What does the Bible say? It says a saint falls seven times and stands back up. We're going to be back in the battle. Knock me down. All right. Next time, that punch won't work anymore. Amen. Amen. Next time, that punch is going to get your arm broke. 
Okay. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Got it? We've got things we've got to do. Then it's, we still have the choice to walk in it. We still have the choice. We still, even after we've taken it off and put on, we have the choice to walk in it. God has not made you a robot when you took it off and put it on. You still have a choice. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and do not make forethought of the flesh into its lusts. Now, I think this is kind of a fascinating deal. I learned this this week. How many times have I quoted this passage? Hundreds. I learned something new. I had to change it on my slides because I got into the Greek on it again. Amazing. Right there. It says, and do not make forethought of the flesh into its lusts. I never saw that before. I had to change that on the slide. In the Greek, it's the Greek word, and we're going to see this again later, ice, E-I-S, and it means to go into. And what happens if I make forethought, then I am putting myself a path for me to go into the lust. And for me to go into the lust means what? I'm becoming it again. There's a warning. Do not make forethought of the flesh into its lust. Don't think in advance of how to go back to it. Don't think in advance how to go back to it. It's not the way it works, sir. Just thinking about it is just as bad as doing it. Well, absolutely. If thinking about it is just as bad as doing it because it says if a man lusts in a woman after his heart, he has committed adultery. Okay? Yeah, folks, it's not the action. It's the intent of the action. And this is one of the reasons why I don't like just abstinence, not doing it. Not doing it doesn't do anything because if you're still doing it in your mind, you're still doing it. So the freedom is freedom. Abstinence is just not doing it. I want freedom where I don't have to do it. I don't want to do it. I'm free. I like that part. Who put me in preach mode today? Jesus. Jesus, all right. I tell you, I'm, I'm emotionally cranked up here. I'm about this far off the ground. I'm hoping to... Okay. Calm. Here we go. Here we go. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. When I found that in scriptures, it just about killed me. I didn't know what to do with it. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I had just gotten all this practical stuff that I know how to take off and I know how to put on. It's something that I have to do. I got to do it myself. And then I'm sitting here going, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going, uh, mm -hmm. how do I do that? That's a little crazy. How do I do that? Well, we're going to be talking about that. John 3. John 3, oh, probably one of the most well-known passages in the world except only one verse. The passage is not well-known but the one verse is well known. Let's just start in verse 14, okay? And it says, And even as Moses lifted up the serpent... This is Jesus. He's talking to a guy that came to him at night, named Nicodemus, and Jesus is talking to him. Now, this is Jesus. I don't know how many people know that John 3.16 is in red in most red version Bibles. Jesus said it. See, most of us don't understand that he's the one. We quote it all the time. We think it's talking about him, but it's him talking about him. It's him talking. I think it's fascinating. It says, Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone believing into him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that everyone believing into him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, this is a fascinating deal. Here, again, is the Greek word ice. Shows motion. Now, I've, in, the King, in the Strong's Concordance, it says to pronounce it like the word ice, like ice in your drink or falling on the ice or all that ice on your roof or what? On thin, thin ice. There's a good one, okay? Ice. Um, some people say ace, E-I-S. It should be ace. And then I got a new one lately. One of the guys says that should be pronounced ease. And I went, I think nobody knows. That's what I'm beginning to think. So I'm going to call it ice from now on, and you just have to deal with it, okay? Ice shows motion. Every time this word is used, it shows motion. And we're going to see this in, in again, even in these verses. Why would it show motion in one time and not motion in another? This is not believing in. This is not mental assent. I believe in something. Ooh, I believe in it. It doesn't do anything about it. But believe into means I'm from the outside, and I believe into that's pretty, pretty neat. He says, 
for the Son of Man lifted up that everyone believing into him should not perish. For God gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes into him should not perish but have everlasting life. That means I'm on the outside and my believing takes me inside. And that was a good place for an amen right there. That was a marvelous place for an amen. Not just mental ascent, but change of position. Wow. Now we've been trying to get this. The very next verse says this, For God did not send his Son into the world. This is the same world word, right? God did not send his son into the world that he might judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So God sent him into the world to save the world. He was outside the world, and now he's into the world. You see that? I can't read that. Amen. Oh, there's an amen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, into the world shows position. And he says the one believing into him is not condemned, but the one not believing has already been condemned, for he has not believed into the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now we can get off into the name of God right here pretty strong. I've got to believe into his name, meaning what? I am in his name. How do you get into his name? By exchanging names at covenant. Are we just throwing all sorts of stuff in here, aren't we? I've got to believe into him. I've got to believe into his name. I've got to believe into. Shows a vast change of where I was to where I am. Am I making sense? This was true in the spirit. It also has to be true in the soul. Since salvation of the spirit was done at an event, salvation of the soul is a process, which means what? I am continually having to believe into him. Aren't I? It wasn't just about the salvation of the spirit. It's about the salvation of my soul. My mind has got to be saved. Now, people say, well, that's weird. Never heard of that before. Get into the Greek. There's a word all about that. It's the Greek word sophroneo. Sozo means salvation. We get salvation. Every word in there that has salvation or saved is from the Greek word sozo. And then it puts phroneo on the side of it, and that means thought processes. And the word literally means to have saved thinking. That's pretty impressive. He says, well, for we should not be high-minded, in Romans 12, 3, but we should have saved thinking about ourselves. Don't lift yourself up, but have saved thinking. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of saved thinking. That's where that Greek word is used, sophroneo. He's given us a spirit to get our heads saved. Why does the helmet of salvation called or the helmet called the salvation, head of salvation, the helmet of salvation. Why is salvation being put on my head? Because i got to get my thoughts saved. Folks, I'm, I'm less saved in my brain than about anywhere. Aren't you? I mean, aren't I? Aren't we? Aren't we, huh? Man, and again, we could talk about this forever, is that we think we're alone in our thoughts, but we are not alone in our thoughts. God knows everyone, and he knows them intimately. And yet we think we can just get away with everything in my thoughts. No, because it's in there that we need the salvation. Where? At our menorah. The light that shines in us has got to be good light, not darkness. What happens if the light within you is darkness? How great is that darkness? That's in Matthew. Okay, I hit too many rabbits here. I've got to go back here. Okay, here we go. Putting on Jesus Christ. We take off the old man. We put it to death. We see how Jesus sees us, and we purposefully put that on. There's a taking off and the putting on. It says, we see ourselves in our new identity, and we must choose to walk in it, choose to not go back to the old man. And that's just a little review, and then it says, okay, Jesus has been with us the entire time of this process, and he's been showing us our old man. He's showing us our new man. He's right there in the process with us. He's right to do him. We need to walk right up to him. And we need to step into him. Now, I've done this with so many people. And they're sitting there in my office, and they've just seen, I'll just take the porn issue, they've just seen all this defilement all over them, and they have to confess it to the Lord, and they have to start taking it off. And they break their covenant with it, and they throw it down at their feet, and they're taking all this slime off of them, and then they put it to death. 
and they bury it. Is that exciting? You look at them and say, how do you look now? Most guys say, uh, I'm naked. But it's okay. The defilement's gone. Cool. Lord, and Jesus is right there with them. Lord, would you show them what you want them to wear? The Lord shows them. And it's, it's all sorts of different stuff. It's suits of silver armor. It's white robes. It's blue robes. It's purple robes. It's, I mean, it's whatever is going to be meaningful to this person. And they put this new identity on. Is that too cool or what? And they're standing there in their whole new identity. How's that feel? And they go, whoa! And the question to ask is, where's the porn? Where's the defilement? Oh, it's gone. I have never yet had a person say, well, there's still a tinge of it in my left armpit, but it's, you know. <laughs> Nobody ever said that. They say, it's gone. And I said, would you have believed 20 minutes ago that you could say that the pornography is completely gone? And they go, wow. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's the reason why we didn't get it, because we didn't believe it. And then all of a sudden we say, okay, I've got another thing to do. Where's Jesus standing? Oh, he's, he's right here. Okay, I want you to turn to him. They, they look at him. Now take one more step. Step right up to his chest. When, almost everybody that has ever seen this, their nose is right about in his chest. I don't know why he's so huge each time, but they walk up and he's just, he's just huge. I say, okay, now take one more step. And you see these people and they, they go up to him and then they take this step and they go, oh. What'd they do? They did exactly what the scripture said. They put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know any other way of doing it. They step right into him and his presence is powerful. Okay, He is extremely real. And my view of everything changes in him. And we're going to be talking about this. My relationship with him right that instant increases. Now, I hear people say, this is so mystical. This is not mystical, folks. This is a reality. This is more real than the chair you're sitting on. Okay, remember this? Jesus is the veil. It's his heart. There's the, the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant back there that's holding all this. My covenant with the Father is in Jesus. And there's all these false identities. And it's keeping me from going in, keeping me from knowing who I am. I have flesh instead of spirit. Instead of love, I have lust. Instead of light, I have darkness. If I can get rid of the veil, then what? Now, I want you to notice something. Where's the direction of that arrow going? Into the Holy of Holies. We've been wanting to get back there for how long? 23 messages. Okay, We've been trying to get back there for... Now we've got a chance. What are we doing? We're going into the Holy of Holies. But how do you do it? How do you do it? I love this part. Greg, come here. and Bring a friend with you. If you two will come right over here, please. One stand on one side, right there. And one stand on the other side. Now hold that up. No, right about there. There you go. Now, hold it up just a little bit more. It's a little bit higher. What's back there? The Holy of Holies. What's out here? The Holy Place. What do I need to do? Die to myself. I need to take off my old man and put on my new man. And then it says, now step into Christ. Thank you. Let go. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm doing. Thank you, gentlemen. What am I doing? I'm going to have to put on Jesus Christ. I'm going to have to make it so that he is the one being seen, not me. I'm putting on Christ. Now, I can function here. I can see. I can do stuff. But what am I doing? It has to be Jesus that's being seen. It has to be Jesus that's going through it. It has to be Jesus that is the ruling of my life. I've got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? So he could be seen and not me. So that he can be seen. Am I making sense? Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, is this a reality? It needs to be, doesn't it? Because where is he? He's right here at the veil. He's right here at the veil. He's the one. He's my everything. And if I want to go in, 
I have to go through him. I have to go through him. I have to get into Christ, don't I? There's not a way around him. No man comes to the Father but through me, and by me, and into me. Yes, sir? Um, I am crucified with Christ, therefore what? Nevertheless, I live, but not I. But Christ lives in me. And this life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the crucifixion of myself with him, it did include the spirit. My spirit was crucified with him. But now my soul has got to be crucified with him. It shows more process. Make sense? Okay. Where am I? I'm right here. When I go into Christ, I get what? In the covenant. When I put him on, what am I? I'm included in the covenant. What else happens? I'm in the Holy of Holies. How did I get there? Through him. I can walk this way. Therefore, I'm in his presence. How do I get the presence of God? By going in him. So the presence is always manifesting. I am in the glory. How do I become the glory? By in Him. I can become who God called me to be because I'm in His covenant. This way I can walk in the Spirit. I can walk in the light. And I can walk in the love. And where is it going to happen? It's going to happen right there. Well, what's the key to this? It's finding the hindrances and choosing to get rid of them. What has God called us to do? Be in Him. Okay. Wow. In Christ. Precognitive communications. I love to ask this question to people. Okay, you're in Christ. They're saying, they're going, whoa. So like, well, how fast is your communication with him when you're inside him? And they go, instant. It's faster than instant. It's precognitive. You know, what? I can't even get the sentence out. And he's answering. Why? He knows my thoughts, man. It's faster than I can possibly process it. I know what it's like to be in him, and he's answering, he's answering stuff. Now, he doesn't answer the way you want him to, by the way. I just want to make sure you knew this. Okay? Precognitive communication. The greatest issues are answered right here. And here's somebody saying, how fast is your communication? Well, it's, oh, it's precognitive. Okay, I, I love doing this. I love this. This is, this is candy. This is a caramel apple, which is one of the best things on the planet for me. This is right there. I ask them, ask Jesus right there, do you love me? Man, they're standing in Christ and they're saying, Lord, do you love me? And the God who is love is communicating to them. The God who died on the cross for us that commends his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that love is the love that is communicating. And you ask the question, do you love me? How do you think he's going to answer? You know, most of the time it's not even a word. And the person says, Lord, do you love me? And he just goes, oh. He just shines his love. They experience it. Now, Listen. As we've heard in testimony, I was a hardcore militant Baptist for a long time. Okay? God set me up and set me over to a vineyard. And in that vineyard, what happened? Oh, he locked me in. Literally. And I was stuck in this room and I went down and I finally went down and yielded to what the Holy Spirit was saying to me and I was not happy about it. Okay? I went down and I submitted to this and I said, okay. Walked up to John Wimber and I said, you know why I'm here, now do it. Slammed my books down. I was so mad, red in the face, veins popping out of everywhere I know. And he was just laughing his brains out. He knew what I was there for. <laughs> Irritating. He turned me sideways and he put his hands on my chest and my back and said, bless him, Lord. I was there for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You want to know what happened in that second, that very second? I had chosen to take off my whole identity of Baptist. And I was putting on my identity of a Christian. I took off my religion and I went down there to step into a relationship. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, yes, but something... I mean, it was all this stuff that happened at that point. And it was the first time in my life, and I was how old? 
I was 30, 31, 31 years old. Born again since I was five. First time I'd ever experienced the love of God. In Him. I'd chosen to come and be in Him and be overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. What's the difference between the Holy Spirit and Jesus? They're the same God, folks. And who does the baptizing in the Holy Spirit? Jesus does, the Bible says. So who was involved in this? Jesus was. And I stepped into God. It changed, radically changed my life from that moment on. Wow. Okay. Another question you can ask while you're in there, kind of a fun question to ask is, can I trust you? You know, this trusting God is the issue, isn't it? Do you trust him? No. If you did, there's a lot of stuff you'd be doing differently. So, what's one of the questions I love to have people ask is, Lord, can I trust you? And you should see their face when they hear from God and God says, yes, you can trust me. And their doubts melt away and all their junk flows away. Uh. I like to ask them, well, what happened to your old man? Actually, I ask them the specific thing is uh, their specific problem, whatever it is. Where's the pornography? Where's the fear? Where's the insecurity? <laughs> They're standing in Christ. What problem can they still have? It dies right there. Talk about a dumb question. I love to ask them this question, though, because nobody's been able to answer me yet. How do you feel? You know why they can't answer me? Because they've never been here before. They don't have words to describe what it's like to stand in Christ and have this freedom that they've never had right there. I love to ask, how does that feel? Cool. Second Corinthians 5.17 says this, so that if anyone is in Christ... He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This verse now means more to me than it ever did before. Can this mean at salvation, at the spirit salvation? Absolutely. But does it also mean during soul salvation? Absolutely. Uh, no, that's N, E-N. It means it doesn't show that there's been motion. It means that there's already been something accomplished. It's already in. If any man is in Christ, not into Christ, but if a man is in Christ. But how'd you get there? By believing into. You had to be on the outside to get in. Okay, but this is in. In Christ. He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What is in Christ and what isn't in Christ in my life? Now, that's called dangerous asking. That's going to get you. You start asking the Lord, okay, so Lord, what in my life is not of you? You know what he's going to do? Show you. Why? Because he wants it gone. Why? Because he doesn't want you to have any fun. He wants you to be like you're sucking on a persimmons all the time. No. That was the religion I grew up in. What does he want? He wants all this stuff removed so that you can know him. The goal of all things becoming new. The goal is all things becoming new. That's what I want. That's what you should want. That's what we should have, wanting. This is who he created me to be. If anyone is a brand new creation, this is who he created. This is my new man. If any man be in Christ, he has a whole new creation. Old things have passed away. This is, and Rick's not here. I, I wrote this up here just for Rick. This negates the fall of creation. You see, the fall ruined my spirit. True. My spirit's now new. But the fall also ruined my soul, didn't it? Now I've got something new. This negates all the stuff that happened at the fall except for one item. You see, we should be able to get rid of all this stuff. Now, I wish I could say we're going to be able to get rid of all the stuff out of our soul. That we'd be totally, totally saved in our soul while on this planet. I hope that works out for you. I don't know anybody that has ever gotten that far. Okay? I still, my goal is to try to make it so that there's no culture shock when I go into heaven. I'm totally an idiot. Oh, it's not going to happen. But it's all good. 
okay? But I want to, I want to have it. I'm getting into heaven. Negating the fall. There's only one thing that they will not do is you still have a fallen body living on a fallen planet. But God gave us kidneys to deal with the fallenness that's in our bodies. Our bodies can be holy. You say, kidneys, go back to the outer court, get the CDs on the altar and labor, and that'll explain it all to you. Well, it explains something to you. <laughs> I don't think anything explains it all anymore. All right. Philippians 3, 8 through 9, says this is fascinating. But no, rather I count all things to be lost because of the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them to be trash, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having my own righteousness of law, but through the faith of Christ, having the righteousness of God on faith. Now what did he just talk about here? He talked about all this stuff that he had counted as gain before. Born of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day. All his credentials were thrown right out there. And he says, now all of that is garbage. All of it is garbage. I count it all as loss. It didn't gain anything to me. It actually took away from me. But I'll throw it all away for the excellency of knowing Jesus Christ. And he says that I might gain Christ and be found in him. What a strange way of saying it. Be found in him? Yeah, by others. What a strange way of saying it. I want to be found in him. In other words, I want people to look at my life and go, oh, there he is, he's in Christ. I want others to be able to see it. Be found in him. In him has the only value. Being in him is the only thing of value. Ephesians 1.3. Now, if I ever have signed a book for you, uh, you know, people say, would you autograph a book for me? Sure. That'll increase the value by probably not being able to give it away. I don't know. Um, I'll sign it. I always sign it, Lee, Eddie, and I, underneath it I put Ephesians 1.3. Why? Because that is, that is probably one of my biggest, deepest revelations. It says there, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. So what does this verse say? This is one verse that tells us the entire series of the blessing. The entire series of salvation. The entire series of what it means to be in Christ Jesus. There it is. I get everything. Everything in him. Absolutely everything is in him. There is no negative thing in him. There isn't anything I, I regretted after being in him. In, oh, well, I wish I hadn't seen that. No, no. The only thing I regret, the only thing I regret is not being able to always experience him. I don't ever have to leave, but my cognitive understanding is swayed. I mean, I cannot... It's like staying on the mountaintop. No, you have to still go live in the valley, but he's still with you in the valley. Okay? There's, there's, there's ups and downs of this thing. I know the experience of this thing, but I also have to live in a regular world and out there, but I don't have to ever get out of him. But that experience... Man, I want to live in that experience. What happens on the stage up here? See, I just don't care what all's going on out here. And I know that sounds very callous. I really, I do care. I want you all to enter in, but I'm not dependent upon you entering in. Not when I'm there. You know what I'm doing when I'm there? I'm entering in. I am seeing Him. I am wanting Him. I want to express to Him everything that's in these songs. This is why sometimes I can't sing them because I just the, the meaning just blows my head and I, and I just stand there like a bobblehead. Everything of God is in Christ. We, how do we find it? We find that it says everything, everything is in Christ. Everything pertaining, everything of God is in Him. It says the fullness of the deity is in Him in bodily form. Fullness of the deity. Everything I get from the Father, I have to go through Jesus for. Everything of the Godhead is in Jesus Christ. Is in my, my Lord. Whew all right in there. We gain it all by being in Him. There is nothing to be gained anywhere else. It's in Christ. 
He is the fulfillment of the ages. Okay, in him, the Father and Son have covenant. When I am in Christ, I am included. Everything else is idolatry. Everything else is idolatry. Every hindrance is a veil and a hardness of heart. Everything else. We have to start looking for these things. It all keeps me from him. Now, when we take these other things, as you see Christ there, and I put up a hardness of heart, what am I putting up in front of him? Guess what? I don't get him when I get this. Let's make it personal. We, 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 de- we decline to make it personal. We don't want to make it a personal affrontery to Jesus to have these things. We just, well, it's just, I said, no, I'm not against Jesus. Yeah, you are. When we do this, we are doing exactly against him. It's against him personally. I hope you get that. I hope you get that. How important is all this now? Now, how important is all this other stuff? See, I wanted to... D- d- it. <laughs> Upper plate just came down. I don't know. I want it to decrease in importance in our lives. I want to see it for what it is. This, whatever it is, is keeping me from Him. I want to have the Him, not that. Now, what do you truly want? What do you truly want? Well, let's look about this. What do we talk about abiding? We started our year last year in abiding. We don't have to leave inside Christ. We don't have to. We may stay as long as we like. Therein lies the problem. Because we want to leave. Why do we want to leave? We want to leave every time we choose something that is not in Him. Make sense? But we are commanded to never leave because He says, now abide in the vine, remain in Him, stay. We're commanded to stay. Okay? But we dive in and out. You can see it, can't you? Lies and fear are still in control when we dive in and out of him. It's lies and fear that still control. That's what we have to get rid of, folks. What lie have you received? What fear do you have coming to Jesus? That shows you have a false identity. Do we know him as we should? I don't think so. At all times and in every way, we should be seeking Him, in Him. Let's talk about worship for a second. The goal. The goal of everything is worshiping Him. While you are in Him, I love doing this. And I have have had this this awesome experience so many times, it's it's amazing. As people have taken this stuff off, and they've put on this new stuff, and then they stand into Christ. And I, I say, while you're there, do you think you could thank Him? You should see people having a worship experience for the first time. A true worship experience. Where they, they're in Him, there's nothing between their soul and the Savior, and they say, Lord, thank you. And they turn their soul to Him. Whew. You know what I do while they're worshiping? I join them. We have ourselves a little worship party. Away we go. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. (laughs) Wow. Go my soul. Go soul. Go. Do it, man. All right. Explore His depth of who He is. It's a change in priorities. And you don't need music to worship. Amen. You don't need music to worship. Now, I love music. Don't get me wrong. I am not one to diss music. I love music. I think it's rather obvious today. I use the tool of music, but I don't need the tool of music. I like just standing in His presence. And, you know... It, my sentences, I almost never finish a sentence in there. Why? Well, he already knows them. I mean, it's just like I'm trying to talk to him and I can feel my expression go to him. 
You understand? I just, I thank you. He's just like, thank you, praise you. You're whew, awesome. Awesome doesn't cut it. We've made donuts awesome. You understand? Wow, that's awesome. No, it's a donut. Okay? God is awesome. We've taken the words that express depth and made them common and meaning play, meaningless, commonplace. And so what, what do we have to explain him to whom he is anymore? It used to be awesome that God was awesome. You know? Wow. We have, our thesaurus has been shrunk. See him for who he is. Oh, you'll never want to leave his presence. Now let it flow. Let your worship flow. What do I want you to do when you come in here and we start the music? What I want you to do is just get along with Jesus. Get rid of the hindrances of all the problems, all the stuff you've been thinking about, uh, how to get the kids ready for church. Yeah, that usually will drag you right into the flesh immediately. Okay. Amen. Okay, just, it's just so difficult. Wait a minute. Stop. Get rid of it all. It doesn't matter. Oh, we have a house payment due. <laughs> Inconsequential at this point. Oh, we have this problem. This problem, our car isn't working. Our leg isn't like this. Or my, you know, I'm, I'm sick. I'm, I got the flu. I got the... Shut up. It doesn't work. What do you need to do? Throw it all away for a while and get into Him. And you'll find there is where your answers for all the other things lie, but not because you ask it, but because He shares it. Very, very, very deep. Oh, you don't have enough words? Oh, that's cool. That's fine. You don't have enough words? Ask him to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Now, for those of you who have ever done any of this you know, ministry of getting people baptized in the Holy Spirit and you find all the, the religion that goes with it, and I, I get really sick of it. Hang on, brother, hang on! The next guy standing and let go, just let go! Well, make up your mind! Okay, I've had this stuff happen to me. We get so much religion and we, we try to make things happen. I'll tell you something. Whenever I've had anybody step into Christ and, they, and I say, just ask him, Lord, would you please baptize me in your spirit? They're in him. Who does the baptizing? Jesus does. Is he going to say no? He has never said no. And every single time it has worked. And they're going, whoa. You just see him just wash with the things of the Holy Spirit. That's kind of cool. And I say, do you have any words to express that to him? No. Cool. That's really cool. Well, just open up your spirit and start expressing and don't worry about whether it's in English or not. And they go, tongues just flow. You say, well, wow, does it have to? No. But does it? Most time. I say about 98% of the time. Why? Because I cannot express in English what I want to express to him. And when I'm standing in him and it's time to express it, i got to express it somehow. And so I let my spirit take over and my body just flows along with it. And I go right into tongues. Just that was a little seminar on tongues right there. In case you didn't know where I stood on that, that's where I stand. All right. You want to know something else that's really, really wild about all that? The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine which in, wherein is debauchery or excess or overwhelmingness. He says, but be ye constantly being filled by the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, wait a minute. I go through all this stuff and I'm, I, I fill myself up with selfishness. And I fill myself up with that junk and crud and I fill myself. So I start getting rid of it. What do I do? I fill the hole. You want to know a really good way of filling the hole? I tell people, just raise your hands to him right about now and just say, Lord, fill me up. You say, that's simple. Yeah, does it work? Every time. Lord, fill me with you. Fill me with your spirit. Uh -huh. Isn't that fun? Okay. You can express with more than words that way. I like this part where you can just express. Man, it's hard to express. You become one with him. What was his prayer? Father, I pray that they will be one with me like I am one with you. Whoa! Where do you do that? When your soul is in him. That's one with him. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Man, I've got to have a relationship with all three. In Jesus, I get to the Father. 
And you know how I'm doing that? By the power of the Holy Spirit. All three are involved by this thing. <laughs> Fulfillment is right there. How about my daily walk? Now, this is something I've got to let you know, that I've been pushing on my daily walk to apply this. This week has been very important, knowing what I was going to be talking on. And I've been sitting there, and okay, okay, Lord, would you kind of show me when I'm not in you? I've never had the Lord talk to me so much. I want you to think about that for a second. Some of you, that'll, that'll, that'll come later during lunch. You'll get that. Man, he's telling me all these times that I'm just, I just get out of him so easy. I just get on living with life. And I'm just doing stuff. And I'm out there doing stuff. And the Lord says, <clears throat> remember me? <laughs> yeah. Can I join you or what? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Hey, that's a good idea. Come on in. Let's, uh, let's do this together. Fine, man, we're having a good time. <clears throat> uh, can I join you? Wow, that was about 10 minutes. What happened? The Lord says, that was a long one. E. Flesh takes me out of him. Flesh takes me out of him. Do I know his presence so that I know it when I see it? Am I familiar with it? What is my response to things? Anger? Well, then I know I'm not in him. Immediately I know I'm not in him. Anger to me is like alcohol to a guy that's had a problem with alcoholism. I can't afford it. I'm not going there. I feel anger start rising. I'm done. Why? Because I was addicted to anger. Anger was a problem to me. Ask my wife. I can't afford it. I can't afford anger. I just will not love. Why? As soon as I feel the anger, I know I'm in the flesh. There's no God involved here when I start to get angry. I have to stop. Yeah, there's a God involved. It's me. That's right. That's very good. Thank you, honey, for sharing with me my idolatry. Okay, so. That's what you thought. That's exactly right. That's what God gave us wise for, to show us the flesh. It's in our lives. Okay, and then moving on, yes. But in Him, things are different. In Him, I respond differently. I can tell when I'm in Him. My identity can only be in Him. My ability to respond godly changes things. Amen. Amen. I become more like Christ-like when I do that. We must die to ourselves. We must put on who we are. We must step into Him and stay. We, with Him, living out through us, then we are the glory. That's how we become the glory of the Lord. We have our true identity and freedom. Where? In Him. Did that make sense to you this morning? Did I talk fast enough? Not too bad. My wife said it's not too bad. I'll take that one. All right. Okay. What are we getting? Folks, the last three weeks. See, I've not had a practical time of explaining of how, to, how to work this in our lives. But Lord wants us to see what it means to be in him and to see our responses. Folks, there's an awful lot of flesh in our lives that we just don't even want to look at. But it's true. But it's true. So, let me pray for you. Then we're going to do something. Father God, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for the beauty, the beauty of your holiness, the beauty of who you are, the absolute amazing glory of your shining splendor. You are the shining light of the Father. Lord, you are magnificent. And Lord, you are touching each one of us in the room here with showing us areas in our lives where we have not put ourselves in you, where we have resisted and we've been worshiping ourselves and we've been walking in our flesh and our selfishness so often. Lord God, you're calling us to a higher plane, calling us to a time of greater walking in you. And Lord, for that I will give you praise. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. We thank you. You are awesome. For this we will give you the praise and the glory. So, Lord, would you please show us right now what you want to do. And, Lord, may you walk this out. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in our lives. May we see you 
love you and experience what you are doing. For all this, we will give you the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen.